Once again, taking your Bibles and turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If you remember a few weeks ago, we uh, preached from Matthew chapter 18, if one be offended. And this is kind of the other, the other half. I, uh, I kind of waited um, to uh, bring this one. Um, was kind of this discovered that we need to hear not just practical messages, which I bring a lot, but, uh, you know, doctrinal, church doctrinal, you know, scriptural doctrinal messages that we need to understand and know. And it, it became apparent to me that this one here is not understood and maybe misunderstood. And so... Um, I, I never had a problem with it, but apparently there are those who, who do struggle with this. So I'm going to try to bring this to you this morning. Starting at verse 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now, again, Paul's writing to the church here. This is Paul writing to the church. This is, uh, <clears throat> again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And he's writing to the church here because they need to be corrected, okay? There, there, there's some, probably a misunderstanding. There's probably some issues. And maybe they were not clear. But you have to understand, Corinthians was a, a port, okay? And it was wicked, okay? The Corinthian people were very wicked. And you say, well, this is a church. We understand that, but you have to understand too, there's a lot of influences in the town, okay? Let's say this, you know, we're in West Jefferson and there would be influence, people trying to influence, which they have, okay? We won't go too far into that, but they have tried to influence. They want us to do this, this, and this with them, and I'm not doing that. And, you know, we'll just stay away from that because we're not comfortable with doing those things that they're doing. But verse 3, For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. So we know it's a man. Okay, we know that what he's done is wrong. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you gather together in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. No, you're not the little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now we've been through that great day of the atonement, the tabernacle, so we should understand that part of it. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So Paul's already wrote to them in one of the epistles. Not to have this, not to, you know, you're not to uh, have company with this kind of person or a person who's doing this. You're not supposed to have company with it. Yet not altogether with fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. So there gives us an inclination that the man is a member of the church at Corinth. Okay, he's a brother. Or covetous or idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. But them that are without God judges. Therefore, put away from among them yourselves that wicked person. All right. So the title is Fornication Among You. That's what we have. Fornication Among the Church at Corinth. Now, I want to 
reiterate some of the scriptures that I had read last time in that, uh, just so we understand that we just can't take what Christ said in Matthew 18 and, and, and what Paul is saying here and saying, okay, Christ outweighs Paul. That's not the case. Again, Paul wrote Timothy in chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfectly, perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So there gives us our, our, our groundwork for what the church is supposed to do. And more so what Timothy was supposed to do as a young preacher or the pastor of the church, what they're supposed to do. We, uh, the, the scripture is given to us for many reasons. Paul states here that it's profitable, okay? So it's very needful for us in doctrine to reprove, to correct, and to instruct in righteousness. So that's what the Bible's here for. It's for those things, especially when it comes to in the church. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, uh, <clears throat> which you all should know, for the prophecy came not of old time, but by the will of man, not, excuse me, let me start again. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So I have no problem with saying to you this morning that Paul was led by the Holy Spirit to write this letter to the church at Corinth. So, uh, in fact, he wrote two letters to the church at Corinth. Again, you have to understand something. They were having issues. They were having problems. They were, they were sin saved, but they were pretty rough people to begin with. So, and I'm sure many of them were mariners and, and they came to and fro. So we've already read 1 Corinthians here. But I want to focus on uh, verse 5 here just for a minute. It says, To deliver such a one uh, unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at a few verses of scriptures concerning this. Uh, the reason for turning them over was not to be killed. They weren't to die like the Old Testament. And we're going to be getting in a couple of them verses too. But they were supposed to be uh, kind of dealt with in a manner that was Christian and that they were supposed to be able to see the difference between one person that is saved and committing sin and one person that's not saved and committing sin, of course. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, now I command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Then look at verse 14. He says there, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. So there's what we're after. So when we turn one over to the Satan for the destruction of the flesh, what we want done, we want them to be ashamed of what they did. See, and, and, and the main thing here, and I'll get to it in a minute, the whole thing behind 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is basically sin. We need to understand the, the, the problem there with sin and how serious it is. And that's where I see that many Christians today, many churches today are not taking sin uh, religiously. I mean, they're, they're not seeing it as anything. Everybody does it, right? That's what the, the, the cry of the world is. So they're not taking it seriously enough. Sin is Sin, it is a problem. God hates it. It's an, it's an uh, abomination to God. So if it's abomination to God, then where should we stand on that? After all, what did Christ come to do? See, he came to forgive us of our sins. He died on the cross for our sins. Do we go back and live in this sin again? No. We're supposed to do better. We're supposed to get rid of this out of our life. So now turn to 1 Timothy, 
in chapter 1 and verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So many have taken this faith and just destroyed it. And that's what's happening in many churches today. The faith is being destroyed because of the sin. Then we see what Paul says here about a couple people. He says, of whom is Hymenus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So Paul has turned on these two in a sense and saying, look, you're blaspheming in the name of the Lord with your teachings and therefore it's got to stop. So he's turned them over to Satan, not physically, but spiritually. They need to understand in the spirit what they're doing is wrong and correct that. Because if they don't, we see over there in 1 Corinthians that God may take them out if it becomes too, too active. So then in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14 Here we see Alexander again. Paul's writing another letter to Timothy. This is the second letter to Timothy. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. And I think I brought this to your attention. When you're having a struggle with somebody, you know, how do you pray for them? Well, here's a good example. The Lord reward him according to his works. Let's not take vengeance on that person. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. But here's what we can pray. Lord, <laughs> Reward them according to their works. Whatever they're doing, then deal with them in that, in that manner, in that fashion. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. So there you have somebody that's in the church that will not listen to what Paul's saying. He will not, and, I, and we run across this from time to time. I run across this all the time in, in secular life. People just will not you know, accept authority. They hate authority. They will not be under authority. So many times if that kind of person comes into the church, whether they're saved or not, they come into the church with the attitude, well, I don't have to obey authority. See? And a lot of times they, I, I've noticed this and because I worked around a lot of uh, Vietnam veterans, there was one of the reasons, okay? They were in the service and they had enough authority. <laughs> you know, they had enough somebody telling them what to do. And so when they come out, they kind of bitter concerning that. I noticed that, you know, with our foremans and stuff like that, you know, they, you know, the foreman goes up to them, asks them to do something, and they give them an attitude. And there's a problem there. Then in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20, that I mentioned last time, them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. Now, you know, I've had people tell me, so will you ever do that to me? I'll walk out the door and never come back. Well, that wrong attitude, Okay. You have to be corrected if you're in the wrong. You have to be corrected or rebuked if you're at fault. You can't just let it run rampant. And that's what Paul is, is determining here. Now let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 5. It says, it is reported commonly that there is fornication. So somebody has told Paul that the church at Corinth had somebody that had committed fornication. Now, this fornication that was committed... And we'll, we'll go through this here. Well, the fornication is, is sexual immorality. It's wrong. Okay? There's no two ways of getting around it. You can't, you can't look and say, oh, everybody does it. Well, that may be so, but not the, not the members of the church. The church is, is, is supposed to be different. They're supposed to be setting an example for the community. You can't somebody have somebody running out there doing committing adultery, the and especially if it's commonly reported. Paul said this is an open sin. See, it's not like Matthew 18 where it says, if one, if one has trespassed against you, this isn't it. This is openly done. This is openly in the community. This is openly in the church. So what does the church do? The church has to deal with this in the manner that Paul lays out here. This sin was so vile that even the church's pagan neighbors were doubtless uh, scandalized by it. 
the Corinthians had uh, rationalized or minim minimized this sin, which was common knowledge, even though Paul had written them before about it. He mentions that again in verse 9, that he wrote about it. Now, understand the Greek word here. The Greek word for immorality uh, is the root of the English word pornography. So that's, that's where we, we get that. Now, his father's wife is mentioned here. His father's wife. The man's stepmother, the man's stepmother, with whom having sexual relations bore the same sinful stigma as if between him and his natural mother. In other words, it was incest. Incest was punishable by death in the Old Testament. Now turn over to Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 7 and 8. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 7 and 8. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shall, not, shall thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. So the nakedness is between husband and wife, period. That's it. Nobody needs to go any further than that. Then in verse... Uh, <clears throat> In verse 29, we, we um, I think I already read it. Verse 29, thy nakedness of thy father's wife shall thou not uncover. Then in Leviticus, oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Leviticus 18, 29 and 30. It says, for whosoever shall commit any of these abominations. So there it is. It's an abomination to God. Even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. In other words, they were put to death. Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. So these were abominable sins that were not to be committed, and it was not to be done. So Paul's going back and saying, we have to, you have to deal with this. This is not right. This is a law that God laid down before, you know, and people say, well, that's under the law. It's still the law. So what you're saying when you say, well, that was under the law, it's the ceremonial part of it that we don't have to keep. But it is the law. So if you say, well, that's the Old Testament, we don't have to do that anymore. Then what you're saying is you can go out and commit adultery. You can go out and commit fornication. You can murder. You can steal. You can do all those things because, well, that was the law. That's what people want to say when, when, they, when they go that far with it. Then look at Deuteronomy. We want to compare these two, verse, these two, two uh, verses here. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 30. It says, a man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. In other words, again, going back to the nakedness there, you're not supposed to be, you know, being revealed to those things. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 17, 7, going back a little bit, Deuteronomy 17, 7. The hands of the witness shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. So thou shalt put the evil away from among you. Now, here is the problem, okay? Incest was, again, punishable by death, which we see here, and was both, listen to this, uncommon. This was uncommon, not even named. And this will be a surprise to you and illegal under the Roman law. So even the Romans had a law in place where this was not allowed to be done. You just didn't do it. So in this situation, we have this man. And now we can look here and say, okay, we get a couple things from this 
situation. This man was a member of the church, for one. Now the woman, his stepmother, was not. Now many commentators says that uh, <clears throat> let me go back here. Uh, that in verse one there, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now that statement there that should have his father's wife is is saying according to the old testament many commentators brought this out that he actually married his stepmother and they were married but unlawfully they weren't to be married because he's not supposed to be any any kind of relationship with his mother because his stepmother and his mother would be exactly the same thing and it's committing incense and it was not supposed to be done now, a lot of, we have a lot of issues today among uh, our Baptist people are split with this, divorced and remarried preachers. So, uh, you know, how far, do, how far do, you know, how far do you carry that? Where do you go with that? And it's like, okay, here's what the Bible tells us that if you get a divorce, all right, and either or of you remarry, then you can never go back to your first spouse. You can never go back to your first love, according to the scriptures. So it was against the law to do that. You couldn't do that. You couldn't go back and remarry her because then you're committing fornication. And then you're committing adultery. And it was just not to be done. God, God actually forbidden it. And it wasn't allowed to be done. Now, if you divorced and you stayed separate and you didn't, want, didn't go to the bed with anybody else, then if you wanted to reconcile, then you could reconcile and then, well, you're still married as far as the, the God is concerned, but you would, you would be able to live as husband and wife again. But if either or had married, then it's forbidden. So this is the situation that we find and this is the situation that we're under. And like I said, it's a huge argument today on whether uh, uh, a preacher can be divorced and remarried. And it's caused a lot of issues and it's caused problems. So, um, and I hold the view you can't, and under no circumstances. You cannot be divorced and you can be divorced, but you can't be remarried and pastor a church or be a preacher. So there's, a, like, again, there's a big, there's two sides, and we've been fighting it for years and years, that whether or not, then, of course, other things are brought into it, which aren't really scriptural, and I won't get into that. Doesn't have anything to do with church membership. Doesn't have anything to do whether you're saved or lost. Well, let me put it this way. Doesn't have anything to do if you're saved. But what it has to do with is if a man, if a man is called by God, to pastor a church, he can't have another wife anywhere, anywhere. In other words, he can't have married anybody because whether they're divorced or not, she's still out there. Now, some say that if they're if if they die, then they can. Well, I'll, I'll brother Cockrell. I think mean, brother Ray backed me up on this. Brother Cockrell always said, if he ever, if his wife ever died before he died, he would resign from the church because he felt you could not pastor a church in that circumstance. In fact, there for a long time, Brother Cockrell told me this himself. He said, if you, he said, he said, for the longest time, he said, I believe that you could not pastor a church if you were not married. In other words, he believed you had to be married to pastor a church. Until he met Roy Mitchell. <laughs> Once he met Roy Mitchell and seen his life and everything, Roy, brother Roy was never married. But he was a wonderful person, wonderful man. And uh, once he met him, and he, he, he retracted that view. But he did say that if something ever happened to his wife before him, he wouldn't pastor the church no more. So... So he went to the, the extreme. Now, I, 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 even though I understand that, that if something happened to a preacher's wife, that I think, think that he could pastor a church. But I don't know how easy that would be. 
with his with my wife being gone. I don't know if I could do it, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so there, there there's just so many variables. But uh, the other side wants to say one wife at a time. We can't say that because <laughs> you're still under the law. You're still married, you know. And if, of course, if you go ahead and get married and that, then you know you've uh, you've ruined your chances of getting. Uh, the whole the whole idea is reconciliation, okay? That's what God wants. He wants to reconcile you back together again. That's what he's after, and that's what he wants. And you can't do that if there's been an impurity done. So Paul says here in verse 2, you're puffed up and uh, have not rather mourned that he hath done this deed, uh, this deed might be taken away from among you. So... I couldn't find anything on this, but my, my, my feelings were that he was a member of the church, of course, but I think he was friends with a lot of the church members and they just couldn't do it. You know, they knew it was going on and, you know, he could have been a relative or whatever, but he was a friend of somebody's in the church and they just weren't willing to get rid of him. So here, here's the thing about this. The whole purpose, and, and, and most of all the commentators used excommunication. That's what they use, excommunicate them, which we believe it is exclusion. You exclude them. It's not a discipline. It's an exclusion. I'm hoping to bring the next part of this to you, which is in 2 Corinthians, this is Paul's goal. We do this till he come back. So we put them out there for the destruction of the spiritual part of them, or the, not the spiritual part, the spiritual parts can't be together, but their flesh is so, um, Satan does like he did with Job. And he brings so many burdens on his flesh that he's going to realize what he did was wrong. And he's going to come back and repent. Well, in 2 Corinthians, that's what he did. He came back and repented. And that's what Paul's goal was. He said, you got to get rid of it first. He said, once you get rid of it and the person's put out there for Satan, for the destruction of the flesh, then they see the error of their ways and they'll come back. And the problem we have today with that is that's all good and well, but I've hardly ever seen anybody come back. And it's because of their pride. Their pride will not let them come back. Their pride will not let them do. And the church is willing to accept them to come back. If you're going to ask forgiveness, the church is supposed to forgive them, and it's, that's it. You forgive them, they come back in the church, and they start serving God again. That's what we're supposed to do. So it don't really happen that often. And Paul says, well, I'm absent from you, but I've already judged this matter. And you got to get rid of him. you got to get him out of the church because a little leaven, and we all know what leaven is. We brought this up before. Leaven corrupts the whole bunch. If you put a little leaven in the dough, it's going to boom, you know, it's an explosion. That's what leaven is. It explodes. That's why on the, on the day of the Passover, they were supposed to get rid of all the leaven out of their house. They weren't supposed to even have it in the house. They had it in jars and pots and they would set it outside the door. That's where it belonged. You're not supposed to even have it in your house. So there, why? Because there's a temptation there to put a little leaven in the bread because it makes it better. And then, of course, he tells them to deliver him. He said, and your glory is not good. And then he goes into the, the leaven part of it because a little leaven leavens a whole lump. And then he goes back to the feast. Uh, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And then verse nine, again, he wrote earlier about keeping company with fornicators and then he says, not just with, he's saying they're not with just with fornicators of the world, but those that are covetous, extortioners, those that are idolaters, and, and them, they must needs go out of the world. And he's saying, if they don't straighten up, if they don't come back to the church and they repent and see their sins, then he's telling them that God will take them out. And he will, if they're truly saved and they continue in the sin and nothing's done about it, what will happen is God will just take them home. Because, see, the way it was explained to me, God is not going to have you continually be here 
and be a poor witness to him. Why would he do that? Why would he leave you here to be a poor witness? Oh, I'm a Christian and I can go out here and I can do this, this, and this. See, that's not good. That's why he said your glory is not good. You think it's okay, but it's not. So when we take a look at that, and, and the whole thing here is we got to understand how much does God hate sin? This is the part that I have struggles with when it comes to this and, and, and excluding. What does God say about sin? The whole scriptures are full of what he says about sin. Get it out. Don't keep it there. Let, basically, he's saying, get it out. You do your part as a church and I'll do the rest. See? I'll tell Satan what he can and cannot do with that person. Then we can go back and read Job. What did he tell Job? Or not Job. What did he tell Satan when Job brought accusation against, against Job? He said, okay, do whatever you want to do, but don't touch him. Isn't that what he said? You can do whatever you want to do to Job. Don't touch him. So Satan did as best he could to do everything he could to Job without touching him. Then he come back to him. And, and of course, Satan's still accusing him. He's got his hedge around him. He said, remove that hedge. Let me at him. And he says, he'll curse you. So he says, okay. He says, of course, God doesn't have to do this. He's, he's not playing games with Satan. He's not, they're not trying to see who's going to throw the dice and win here. God already knows what's gonna, what, what he's going to allow him to do and what not allow him to do. He said, now you can, go, you can touch him, don't kill him. Do whatever you want to do to his body, but don't kill him. So he did. Go in there and read what he did. What Satan did to, to Job physically. So then he comes back again. He's still not satisfied, you know. And he just says, hey, Job is a righteous man. He's one of my elect. He's my righteous man. There's nothing you can do. See, you've already done it. There's nothing you can do. Job held true to God's word. He held true. And God rewarded him in the end. So then... <clears throat> And then he said, I wrote this. He said, not with just fornicators, but those that are covetous, those that are idolaters, those that are railers or a drunkard or an extortioner with such know not to eat. Now, they used to come together and they used to have fellowship like we're going to do here in a little bit. They're going to have fellowship. And it, he's just telling him, he says, don't eat with these people. It's not just the Lord's Supper he's dealing with. He says, don't eat with them. Don't sit down and say, oh, how you doing, brother? You know, and everything's everything's fine. Now, if you go back in there, I think it was Second Thessalonians there. He says, uh, uh, count them not as, uh, don't count them not as a brother, but they are a brother. You know, continue to expect, experience them or accept them as a brother, but don't, don't like their sin. No, don't like what they're doing, but they're still a brother in Christ. That'll never change, see. So for <clears throat> what have I to do to judge them also? Uh, that are without, do not ye judge them that are within. And then, and them, verse 13, that are without God judges, be, therefore put away the, uh, from among yourselves the wicked person. So that's what the church is responsible to do. Now, I know there's a lot of hesitation sometimes, but we have to come down to this. Sin is sin. You can't let it go on. You can't let a person still continue in sin because what it is, it makes, especially if they're a member of the church, because what it does is it brings a poor reproach upon not only the church, but upon Christ. And it makes a mockery of Christ. It makes a mockery of the church because here's what's going to happen. You're going to run across somebody and you're going to, you're going to find out that you know the same person. And here that person's been in the church and they're going to say, Wait a minute. Where do you go to church? <laughs> I'll go to West Jefferson Baptist Church. Well, I know somebody goes there. And then they tell you who it is. And then they tell you, do you know what this person's done? Do you know what this person's doing? And then if you say, well, yes, we do know. And the church has dealt with that person. And we're hoping that they see the error of their ways and come back. That's all you have to say. And you might say, Nah, it ain't never going to happen. Well, it did. It has. I've experienced it. I had a man come to my church, or not in my church, came to the church, and he says, so-and-so goes here? Yeah. 
And you have no idea what kind of person that is. So I had a poor witness right away because this person was not dealt with. And so they were acting one way in the church. And when they went out to work, they, they worked with the person. And you wouldn't believe it was the same person to hear them talk. Now, you can take it this way. Well, maybe he didn't like him. Well, that could be possible. <laughs> he might not have liked him. But after pastoring the person and after hearing what's going on, I understood. I believed what was going on. So it can happen. It will happen if we don't deal with it. So this is the other side of that. So see, it, 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 we can go to a brother or sister if there has been a trespass against those two. If somebody's trespassed against you, then go to that person and talk to them. But when you have open sin in a church, it's a whole different thing. And there again, you can't separate what Christ says versus what Paul says. You just can't do it. Because... The whole scripture is given by inspiration of God. And we are supposed to use the whole Bible, not just bits and pieces of it. May God bless his word to your heart today.